Thank you and good afternoon. Um, I'm going to speak in English, at least I think it's English. Um, it's probably better known as Australian. So if you have difficulties with the Australian, my apologies. Um, I uh, uh, also want to thank uh, LACNIC and COPA Airlines for coordinating together such that I had a 24-hour detour in Panama City on Monday and Tuesday. And I like Panama City now, uh, but I'm sorry I'm late. I was supposed to be here yesterday. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, give you some idea of what I was going to discuss. I'm going to talk about the Cyber Green uh, goal around ecosystem security, introduce Cyber Green to you as operators, to talk a little bit about the metrics we measure, and then I'm going to specifically share some data about SSDP um, and IoT related denial of service attacks, and specifically look at some data from some of the LACNIC countries talk a little bit about mitigation, and then ask for your practical help. But first of all, congratulations to LACNIC. Um, you may not know, but I was the CEO of ICANN for seven or eight, ten years or something. Um, and I was also uh, the chair of its governmental advisory committee in 2012 when LACNIC was founded. So I was there at the beginning, and so it's very pleasing to see uh, LACNIC now at uh, 15 years. I am chair of the uh, Cyber Green uh, Institute, which is a not-for-profit. I have a day job, so I'm quickly going to do the advertisement for the day job so I can justify my not being in the office. Um, I work with a, I founded a company called Stash, does very secure data storage and content sharing as a software as a service. Uh, we're working with ISPs in North America, and we'd be very happy to work with ISPs in Latin America. So if anybody's interested, please reach out. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the risks that, um, that we're concerned about. I think we all know that the, the risks we face from having an, eco, uh, an internet-based ecosystem that's not as good as it could be are many, and some of them are on this slide, around commercial and economic loss. But the big picture goal, I think, is that we need to increase security, safety, and stability and the resilience of an open, neutral, global internet. It should be an infrastructure for economic and social prosperity. And Cyber Green is founded on the concept, which I am a great fan of, that we should look at this problem much more like we look at public health or we look at carbon and pollution than purely as a security problem. And that we should actually focus on the issues of how do you actually improve an ecosystem? And at Cyber Green, we are dedicated to making the cyber ecosystem healthier by first of all trying to understand and identify systemic risks in the cyberspace. So vulnerabilities, outdated devices, misconfigurations. Secondly, mitigate those systemic risks. And thirdly, continue to monitor and measure the systemic risks. And so who are we? Cyber Green's origins actually originally comes out of a lot of work done at JP NIC and with Japanese ministries. The executive director is Yuri Ito. Some of you may well know Yuri from her role in FIRST. Uh, she's got a long history with the CERTs. Um, so if you may know, may, may know Dan Gear, who's one of our special advisors on metrics. Uh, Richard Soley, who's at the uh, Industrial Internet Consortium. Uh, June Marai is on the board. June's one of the figures who's often referred to as the father of the internet in Japan. Uh, Paul Vixie, some of you know Paul, with other advisors. So we're, we're trying to bring a group of people together who are technical partners, special advisors, data scientists, to help us look at data as a way to achieve this process of an improved cyber um, ecosystem. So we're about measuring, measure, first of all, measurement. And then secondly, being a clearinghouse for risk mitigation best practices. And we also do policy advocacy. And we strongly believe that we should use data to drive decisions, first of all, at the, cert, at the certs. Secondly, and most importantly, and really one of the reasons we want to engage with the LACNIC community, 
with the management of network, oper network operations. So both network operators, but also clearly their management, but how do we get data to help them to drive decisions, and also for policy makers. And one of the things we're concerned about when we collect data on is that we actually think, you know, speaking, speaking bluntly, and that's one of, the, we think, one of the things we Australians do, we tend to speak bluntly, um, the risks of an, of an ecosystem being unhealthy come from misconfigurations, vulnerabilities being left unfixed, and infections. Um, and a lot of these things, frankly, are in the control of the way in which ISPs or networks generally uh, are deployed and configured. This is a slide about DDoS. The only point it wants to make about that is that the Internet of Things is just a much bigger opportunity for creating DDoS attacks, as we all know after the Mirai bot and similar things. And I raise it really because today I want to share with you some data um, around uh, SSDP. Um, and uh, in particular because we want to share some scanning data we have around SSDP um, um, and how it potentially could be used for, uh, you know, utilisation of the IoT. Um, this is a slide we've all seen variations of this about amplification attacks. The point I make about SDTP is that the amplification factor for an SDTP attack is something like 30 times. The thing I really wanted to draw your attention to, which unfortunately is very small down the bottom, is four or five of the of the of the uh, things that we're presently measuring across the internet. So we are, we are measuring open recursive DNS servers, open NTP servers, open SSDP servers, and open SNP servers. We're also doing some measurement of the penetration of the Mirai bot, and we also have a way in which we're calculating total capability of the network for DDoS uh, operations. And I'm just gonna shift across here if I may. And I want to share with you, just draw your attention to our, to our website and show you some idea of it because the, clearly the thing we'd love you to do is go and have a look. We do collect a very large amount of data, data from 39 different sources at the moment. We want to collect more data and we are analysing that data. So at the moment we have a process of trying to say to people what are the level of risk countries pose to others. Now, this we all know we're sitting on a topological network, so to a degree it's a bit of a silly diagram, but the, the diagram is directed towards policy makers to try to get some sense around countries. And what it does let you do on the site is then click and look at particular countries, in this case Brazil, and has both a country comparison and then data which is broken down by autonomous system. And you can understand we've, we've basically taken the regional internet registry's definitions of who sits in what country um, as a, in terms of AS as a definition for a country network. I, I recognise that's not a pure definition. But we have data there on open recursive DNS servers, open NTP, open SNP, open SSDP, etc. Uh, I kept, we haven't got time today to go through all that, but I'm trying to share some of the flavour of it with you so that you get a chance to have a look at it. On the left is, is sort of country as a whole. On the right is the top five um, ASs that are contributing, and the red tends to be all the others, but we can break that data down. And this data is actually available for a lot of research. And one of the things we're engaging with your community is we would like to partner with you to uh, put more resources into really breaking this data down and sharing it. Um, what the data also lets us do is you can do comparisons, at least country comparisons, and here I've just randomly chosen Uruguay, Ecuador, and Bolivia for no, hopefully because I thought there was no comparison between them, that's why I chose the three, um, just to show a little bit about the, the data we collect over time. Um, and the final point I'd share from the site is we actually have quite a lot of material here about metrics and how we do it. So many of you in the room will quite rightly want to know how do you do it, what's your methodologies, how does it all work? Again, for the purposes of, of brevity, um, I'm going to direct you to the site, but we're happy to have that engagement. Uh, we have data scientists working from Cyber Green who are really putting a lot of deep thought into how do you actually scan the whole network, collect this data, analyse it, um, share it and make certain it's as accurate as you can. And we really would like to engage with network operators and others thinking about them.
So this is a resource uh, we would like, we want to hopefully use, useful for you. It's a resource that gives insight, I think, into best practices, which is what I want to come to now. Um, it's a resource, frankly, I think is very useful for talking to senior management. Um, my background, as some of you will know, is actually out of the policy arena. I'm not an engineer. But the, you know, how do you go and get senior people to redirect their attention to giving resources, realising certain decisions have long-term implications? That's why we're trying to collect this data. We, are, we think of ourselves as not trying to solve uh, malaria. We're trying to drain the swamp. We're trying to put as much data out there which will help people actually look at the way in which networks are configured and as much as we can clean that ecosystem such that there's less space available for infection. So I come back now. So again, to share some interesting examples of this use of this data, remember I was talking about SSDP because of its role increasingly with IoT or certainly IoT deployments in the household. And I wanted to take from our data uh, some interesting uh, points for the three LACNIC countries, um, Uruguay, the Dominican Republic and Costa Rica. To a degree, I tried to get some geographic diversity. And you'll see here um, that there's obviously some interesting changes in the, in the parameters. So we wanted to see what, what actually happened there. Uh, these are all raw counts for open SDDP devices or servers. So they've not been normalized. Uh, we're doing a lot of work at the moment on thinking through what's the appropriate normalization processes, um, methodologies we should apply. So first of all, let's just look at um, a, a trend. And here is SSDP, and it's in Uruguay. And so we see there's a nice reduction, if you want to use that phrase, in open SSDP servers um, in the second quarter of 2016 in Uruguay. So what caused it? How can we spread the word and make it a best practice? Well, then we go and have a look and say, well, which autonomous systems were mostly were mostly responsible for that decrease? And how can we get in touch with them? How can we find out more? And the, the, open, the, the, the AS that had the biggest impact um, is 6057. Now, I, I don't know the Uruguayan market as well as I should, but that looks like it's a fairly major player in Uruguay. So we do actually have from this data the ability for both Cyber Green but also members of the community using this data to go to peers and go to colleagues and say, what was it you did that resulted in that sort of a change? And you may all have theories about that. Um, but that's the, it's one of the purposes. We're, we're not just about trying to find who's the bad players. I had a, gave a similar speech in Australia recently which did point out four or five ISPs were not performing particularly well. But that was my home country. I wouldn't do that when I'm visiting. Um, Let's look at Costa Rica, the same, same interesting change, same autonomous systems, and it's the uh, main, main carrier. Again, there's a big change here. Now, with all data, of course, once you go back and check and see whether, a data, whether there's data um, recording anomalies, or, and you will certainly when you go back and look at our data, you will see that our, cha our taking data changes over time a little bit. There's, there's sometimes there's clearly sections where the data collection process hasn't been as good as it should be, so it dips down. Um, but I can tell you that these examples we're sharing here, these are real changes. And so there's been some very specific things happen in deployments, in my guess. The Dominican Republic doesn't have the same shape of the curve, but actually seems to have some um, over, overall improvement in, in the issue around the SSDP trend, open SSDP trend. Um, and again, it's the, sorry, that's the Costa Rican numbers. I don't quite know why I've got those twice. My apologies about that. Um, so there was obviously, we'd have a similar thing for the SSDP, the autonomous system for the Dominican Republic. Um, so I, I share that with you just to, 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 to say that this data, uh, which we are collecting worldwide, uh, which we're collecting on a very regular basis, uh, that we're making comparisons, comparative data um, is there. It's something we would like to work more with the LACNIC community with. It's something we'd like to work with operators here, engage you in, in the dialogue about the collection of such data and if it's important or useful um, and what the, what the best lessons are. 
Um, and our focus is trying to, trying to give a data set that allows some impact of mitigation for the global common good. We, the economist in me says one of the challenges we're facing here is that the economic in incentives for ISPs um, doesn't help address the problem of if a particular ISP is not, is, for instance, let's say, open, have a large number of open recursive DNS servers, the combination effect of that on the risks to every other user of the internet is much higher than, or is certainly high, as well as to their own users, but they get no economic benefit from fixing the problem for the other users. And so it's very similar to like carbon pollution. It's very similar to, uh, well, pollution's a good example. This is actually a form of pollution. And part of what we're trying to do is appeal to the engineering ethic in many respects to say, you know, despite those economic incentives that don't, don't reward an ISP to ensure deployments are perfect each time, or every ISP, we really should put more data out there. We should have more transparency around this such that we can put pressure on people and engage people about doing the right thing, um, either in fixing infections or more importantly, a lot of it's about configurations of deployment. Um, you know, the usual thing, people deploying equipment with the standard, the standard unchanged um, usernames and passwords or one, two, three, fours or all those sorts of things that end up being used by other players. So we're also looking to help uh, build both business level and end user level um, understanding. So what can network operators do? Um, very much ask you to have a look at the statistics for your own country and for your own AS um, and see you might disagree with the numbers. We'd love to hear about that. We'd love you to engage us about measurement. Um, we're op constantly open for discussion about how to improve this data collection. And we also have a set of uh, capacity building mitigation materials for each of the sort of four main um, vulnerabilities that we're presently tracking um, and that we're tracking specifically directed mostly about DDoS uh, um, attacks. So you can see them down there, the capacity building materials. So each of these ones, if you were to click on it, you can actually get the materials available. Uh, we do um, have a program for future mer met metrics as well. Um, at the moment, our current metrics are asset owner focused. Our next version of metrics will focus on IoT device health. Um, and here comes another blatant advertisement. Um, we uh, are presently, there's an enormous amount of work's gone into this. An enormous amount of data has been collected over many years. And in some strange, bizarre way, for those of us who believe in the multi-stakeholder, bottom-up participatory internet, it is three governments who've actually helped us do this. The Japanese government, the British government, and the government of Singapore. Um, and um, first of all, governments don't give ongoing financial support. They tend to give you capital amounts and that sort of thing. Uh, and secondly, this really is something we think should be further sponsored and assisted by the community. Um, and this is a very lean organisation. We're not, you know, not, don't want to uh, be careful about that. But we are, I'm quite blatantly coming here and elsewhere with the community saying, We'd like you to think about whether this is a common good, this is a, um, a benefit to the community. Um, we're looking for people who might be able to help and sponsor. LACNIC's been very assistant to us, but we, maybe there are particular operators who are interested. So that's one thing, I'll be blatant about that. The second thing is um, we're looking for intellectual partners. We're looking for people who want to engage us around thinking about this. We're very interested in people who want to tell us how wrong it all is, people who've got problems and critiques of the way in which our numbers are done or our surveying is done. That's exactly the sort of critiquing we want as we continue to improve this data. So that's the, that's the uh, purpose of my presentation. I managed to do that in 20 minutes. Um, I suppose we should... Um, uh, um, very much like to say, ask, ask for your involvement um, and uh, there's an email address there if you wish to get in contact, contact with us. Um, we'd like that very much. And I suppose open to taking questions.
Para, quien, para quienes quieran hacer preguntas, se acercan al micrófono, por favor. Hi Paul, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to to hear a little bit about the, your your sensor network. How do you collect all this data? Because I think that's really interesting, and um, uh, basically I'm very curious about it uh, yeah. to see how how you you gather and you concentrate all all this data. It, it's an excellent question. I, I'm I'm going to give you a poor answer. Um, what we have. Uh, We have been collecting data with 39 partners um, uh, up till recently. We are now in the process of actually building out our own sensor network uh, to complement that 39 partner. And we're trying to do it in such a way that we can maintain the integrity of comparison of the data. Um, uh, and uh, that's about the best answer I can give you at the moment. Uh, If you are interested in more detail, which people should be, then what I'd like to do is put you in contact with our data scientists who are bit, much better on this than I am. But not just because it's a good thing to discuss. We're actually doing it at the moment, and we'd love to get feedback from people about how to do that well. You know, Putting out sensor networks is a sensitive thing, so we want to do it well, and we'd love to get people's feedback on our plans and what they think. So I'm going to take you up on the question, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. I would really, really appreciate that. Thanks. Good. Hi. Good afternoon. It's Alan Jerome from ICANN, the office of the CTO. Um, we are working on a somewhat related project with different called ITHI on identifier technology health indicators. And uh, one of the questions that I'm being asked all the time is, can you define in just a short sentence what is the health of the internet? And First, I started to say, well, healthy is absence of disease. This is a definition in the dictionary. But people were not very comfortable with that, and they were quoting a bunch of medical advance that saying, no, that's actually not the same way that it works in the human body. And um, so we have been struggling with that, and now we're talking about problems in the Internet rather than health of the Internet. And I was curious if you had come up with a definition of health of the internet. Yeah, no, it's, every analogy has its limitation. Um, I suppose what we, how we've described what we see our mission is, is um, if, you, if you think of it, uh, threats to health, particularly disease-borne type threats to health, uh, survive in either water or air environments, if you want to put it that way, um, or parasites that are coming out of air or water environments. And so what we see, our role is we're actually focusing on the, the water and the air. So if you think of the, the networks, the network ecosystem as sort of the water and the air that feeds the rest of the internet, poor analogy, if you think of it that way, then our focus at the moment is taking that as part of an ecosystem and trying to improve the health of that. Uh, I, and then you know you start going up. What, what's what's a mosquito and what's a what's a what's malaria and what's you know I, the analogies get difficult. Um, the the other part of the analogy I still like about public health um, is uh, it, because it changes the responsibility discussion. If you think about security in the online environment, in the way in which I, I'm originally. A, government official. Now, in governments, the conversation nearly always starts with somebody out of signals intelligence. No matter whether it's Mauritius, Mali, or you know, Norway, my experience has been the same. At some stage, it ends up with signals intelligence. It comes out of the... People start talking about it from a security perspective, because they're the people inside government who tend to know anything. The difficulty is, if you take a public health approach, I've got a responsibility for my own health. My family's got a responsibility for their health. Somebody's got to play a role of who's the doctor. Somebody's got to be the hospital. And somebody's got to be the Centre for Disease Control. Right? There's, there's different responsibilities. And if you can break up the responsibilities for parts of the problem, we're more likely to move forward rather than bundle the whole problem and say it's a security problem. Because then you get caught up with what's the role of government, what's the role of, you know, et cetera. That's one of the reasons. This, this, this data we're sharing here is specifically directed at network operators. 
you know, it's trying to say, look, there's a role and responsibility of network operators in that context of like taking a public health approach. The other side of that is if you're going to do that, you've got to put data out. Uh, just like in just like in in the public health environment, it's it's good data that informs what to do. If you take a security perspective, the secrecy is the core fallback right approach, and that I think causes difficulties. Yeah, uh, actually, I like the last statement you just made. Uh, one of the reasons for the metrics that you're trying to define in our project is to um, bring data to the policymakers to help them design better policies based on fact, as opposed to based on where the wind is blowing that particular day. Uh, another comment I had was when you were talking about pollution, and uh, one of the analogies that I've been uh, drawing recently is with uh, IoT devices that do not get upgraded and become vulnerable to um, attacks because there's a, a vulnerability that's being abused. And those devices are deployed out there. Nobody's going to maintain them. Nobody's going to fix them. And they're going to stay. Maybe they will be in a warehouse for a while and then turn on six months later, but never fixed. And this is not simply a problem that you can fix in your backyard, because you can be attacked by those devices on, from the other side of the that's planet. Right. And, it's, a classic, uh, it's a classic externality, to use yeah, the economist exactly. language. So I start to look at them as pollution. And maybe there could be a way to measure this degree of pollution by those devices that are nefarious now. So let me leverage off what you just said, partly to send a signal to, again, network operators in the room. I, the, the conversation we have with public policy people, and this is the, the London process, this is, this is work I did, we put into the last Berlin G20 meeting, um, is that there are essentially around IoT two forms of, of market failure. The first of them is this lack of incentive for network operators to improve cybersecurity practice in their operations. And that's partly about not having the data. And I, I strongly think, I really do strongly think, network operators would own this problem. It's, it's, it's got expense, but own this problem, rather than having eventually regulators responding to it. And we've already been approached by, ironically, central banks. Central banks coming, being interested in this project. You know, basically, you don't want central bankers coming after you. you know, they get what they want. Um, and so I do think there's a, you know, there's a, there's, if, if, this does, if this isn't addressed by a community, this is going to get addressed by re regulation, which we're messy. On the IoT side, I don't know how we get past that because of the market failure problem. The difficulty with, you know, my, my iPhone is that you can have a market for improvement around security of an of a, of a iPhone because I buy another one in, well, not as often as they would like me to, but I can buy another one, right? And it can improve. But I don't, I don't update my generators or my refrigerator or my car every year just to improve security. So the market begins to fail at the size of that device, or inversely it fails at the other end, where the device is so small and so cheap there's no point in putting anything on it because you're going to throw it away. And so there is an issue, I think, and these are some of the points we put forward to policymakers about greater transparency in the supply chain, more internationally consistent IoT software bill of, bill of materials that you know what's actually in the IoT, require that IoT devices be patchable, um, which has a real issue about what sort of chips they get, get incorporated into IoT devices. But I do think in IoT we are going to see regulatory moves because of these market failure problems. I don't know how long it's going to take. I'm a firm believer in a, in a multi-stakeholder community approach rather than a regulatory approach. But I suspect in this space we may not get it. Thank you. Queda tiempo para alguna otra pregunta, si quieren. It was obviously a spectacularly clear presentation. <laughs> totally. Okay, si no hay más preguntas, entonces le damos un aplauso a Paul.